And welcome to your LSU football fix. I'm Preston Guy, staff writer at TigerBait.com. Tonight's show is presented by Tremonti's Meat and Seafood. Y'all make sure to go check them out for the bowl game. Go get you your tailgating, your home gating, whatever it may be. Tremonti's is the place to get it with 30 kinds of meat and sausage. Of course, they are featuring still this Heaven's Door Staff Select Single Barrel Whiskey. It is incredible. We cheers to it when LSU hired Brian Kelly. Of course, we were excited for that hire. So y'all make sure to go stop by Tremonti's, get you some ribeye rolls, some shrimp rolls, all sorts of good stuff for the bowl game, pre-made foods, uh, foods you can grill yourself. I mean, it is your ultimate stop for game day. LSU, of course, does play a bowl game tomorrow. It kind of feels sometimes that LSU, <laughs> it's, it's like we're so busy talking about, oh, the new coach you're hiring, oh, this recruit. Like, they're still playing football games, y'all. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of wild sometimes to think about. Um, so I'm very excited about my guest tonight. I've got a doubleheader guest. Uh, first off, we're going to bring in Ryan Gilbert of GoWildcats.com, uh, right? Um uh, he's of course with the 247 network and one of the bright up and comers um that I've, I've been told really good things about very knowledgeable about their football team he didn't get to make the trip to houston because he covers the basketball team too but nonetheless excited to have him on this special monday night edition of your lsu football fix because of course tuesday at eight o'clock lsu will be facing the kansas state Wildcats. Ryan, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good, Preston. How about yourself? Thank you so much uh, for having me on here. Of course. No, it's my pleasure. I'm very, very excited to have you on here. Um, got, get to actually talk about some football games, which is always a lot of fun. Uh, all the noise coming into this game from the LSU side is death chart issues. Uh, all the players LSU is missing. How is Kansas State? doing on their end of the health issues and, and opt-outs for that matter. It, yeah, that's a good point to add. K-State relatively is healthy for the most part. Uh, obviously, there's injuries that, you know, come with playing a full season, but Kansas State is pretty healthy. Kansas State's quarterback, Skylar Thompson, uh, missed a few games uh, early in the season, and he missed the season finale against Texas. Uh, he's back. He's 100% ready to go, and he said, uh, him and Chris Kleiman, have both said that he is as healthy as he has ever been in Manhattan. And he said he wouldn't miss this game for the world. So quarterback, no concerns there. K-State's you know, relatively healthy. You love to hear as far it. As, yeah, as far as the opt-outs go, K-State is is also in pretty good hands there. I think every program has had, you know, unless you're at this point, you know, Georgia or Alabama, you've gotten at least a handful of kids to opt out. And the same thing could be said for Kansas State. Thankfully, none of these guys are, are really – um, significant players, uh, transfer portal guys. Um, you know, there's, there's a few guys that have, have, have decided to transfer away, but, mm -hmm. but nobody really that, that makes a big impact. And I, I correct myself there. I said opt outs. Nobody's opted out. Um, transfer portal. Oh, guys. Yeah. There's been a few guys that have transferred out really not a big deal though. Um, you look at, you know, uh, you know, Wayne Jones, a backup linebacker. There's a few guys here and there that, yeah. Would have been nice to have on your team for your depth chart, but the only thing to really look at is the backup running back Joe Irvin and the third string running back uh, Jacardi Wright. Those guys are going to leave the running mm -hmm. back position very thin. However, you know, however, none of this matters if Deuce Vaughn doesn't catch COVID, right. he doesn't you know get injured during the game. Everything will be fine. You know, Deuce Vaughn the whole season's been you know getting 80, 90 percent of the of the carries in the backfield. So. If he's if he's playing, it's not going to be a problem. However, if yeah. Spawn, something does happen to him, that's going to be a problem for Kansas State. I don't think they're going to really run the football much, yeah. if at all, if if something happens to Vaughn. But but overall, relatively speaking, Kansas State's healthy. They're bought mm -hmm. in. Fans are excited, and they want to win this game. Well, and, and what my question is is, you know, of course, that depth at running back, it's probably a little scary going into it. Although Deuce Vaughn has been an absolute stud this year with 1250 yards on the season. Of course, he's an you know, was an all American as an all purpose back. They basically made that position up to give him some sort of award because <laughs> he's been so good, pound for pound, one of the best players in the country. Um, of course, 
Kansas State's bringing out a new coordinator. They're going to give a, a name that's really kind of familiar because I remember being in college, seeing him play quarterback for the Wildcats. That's Colin Klein is going to get a chance to call his game. Are Is the game plan expected to go through Deuce Vaughn or is he expected to be more of an element for this team? I think the backbone of K-State's offense is always to go through Deuce Vaughn. Uh, but I think that Colin Klein's really not going to hold back at all in this game. I mean, Courtney Messingham, um, K-State's offensive coordinator that, was f- coordinator that was fired at the end of the season, was just way too conservative. And that's what got him fired. Fans were just going you know, nuts on his play calling. And I, I don't blame the fans. It was getting pretty embarrassing, if we're being quite honest. Yeah. But- so Colin Klein knows that I, I'm sure that he doesn't want to catch heat, you know, from the fan base. I expect him to pull out all the stops and this is sort of, uh, sort of his quote unquote audition for the offensive coordinator spot for the Wildcats moving forward. From what we're hearing, if, if, if things go well, he calls a good game, you know, good offensive flow. He's going to get that spot next year as the, you know, the full-time offensive coordinator, so to speak. Um, if things don't go well, you, you know, there's there's still a chance that Chris Kleiman could bring in somebody else for that position. Um, an intriguing name that's out there is Matt Wells, um, you know, got fired from Texas Tech this season. He's still looking for a job and, and Wells has expressed his interest in becoming a head coach and not a coordinator. But if he can't find anything this year, maybe he comes to Manhattan and, and becomes that mm-hmm. coordinator. Colin Klein sits behind him for a year, takes some notes and, and learns from a, re- a really good coach. And you know, maybe something like that'll happen. So there's there's a bright future for Colin Klein, but a good showing in this bowl game would be huge for him moving forward. Right. I mean, a lot of his coaching career kind of kind of goes into this 60 minutes of play, which is crazy to think about, but it's a big game um, for the oh, play yeah. callers for K-State, for sure. Uh, it would be absolutely huge for such a young coach, but, you know, we see guys, you know, get, you know, if they can call plays, they get their chance pretty soon. Uh, you know, what's kind of surprising me, this comment from LJ gaming, I'm going to go ahead and put up here. We're going to roll up there 40 deep and run it up, meaning talking about having 40 players and run up the scoreboard, which is not the general energy I've gotten from LSU fans throughout this process. You know, I think a lot of LSU fans are pessimistic about this game, given the just, I mean, the roster is just in a really, really bad spot right now. Uh, is there confidence among Kansas State fans? Is there? Is the? Do they expect that they're going to win this ball game? I think most fans do expect a win, and and kind of that was my initial gut reaction when I when I first saw that that LSU was having these opt outs and stuff like that happen. That okay, K State's just going to cruise by this game and get a win. The more I think about it, and I'm not just saying this to please you guys, but, you know, mm-hmm. LSU is talented. And their second, third strings, you know, these are still three, four-star players that are going to be playing in this game. So I think it's very comparable to look at Texas this year and last year for Kansas State. Um, the Longhorns were playing for nothing. They had no bowl chances or anything like that in the last game of the season. K-State should have won that game. They had no business losing that game. And, and, and honestly, that's why Courtney Messingham, the offensive coordinator, got fired. But that's another story. My point here is that Texas was so much more talented, even though they had no business winning, they beat K-State. And then you look at the year before, um, Tom Herman, everybody and their grandmother knew he was going to be leaving Austin. It was just a matter of time before he left, but he was still coaching at Texas. He had lost control of that locker room. And and what do they do? They come into Manhattan and beat K-State by 30 or 40 points, right? How? Because of the talent, you know? And I think this is very comparable to LSU. It doesn't matter how bought in K-State can be. You know, if that talent goes off, there's nothing that K-State's going to be able to do to stop it. So that's my biggest cause for concern from a K-State perspective. Uh, but most fans are a lot more optimistic than I am. You know, the line has moved. I think it was sitting at around three or four points. It's now up to seven last I checked um, with some news revolving LSU's team. So Vegas is kind of riding high on the Wildcats, but you know, I don't know if I have a great feel for this one just because you don't know which team, you know, from LSU you're going to get. I think most people know that K-State's going to be bought in. They want to win. You know, like I mentioned with Colin Klein, he's playing for something. You know, a lot of these players, this is it for college, right? But LSU, right. are they just going to show up and go through the motions or are they going to show up and play? We'll see what happens. We'll see which game we get. But there's not a lot of film out there for Kansas State. You know, you go back to – um uh, was it the Alabama game where where LSU essentially just kind of changed their 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 minds with what they were going to do? So the first half of the season, that's just irrelevant film that you're watching. And also, 
you know, who'd you guys have? Was it UCLA or, or USC the first game of the season? UCLA, yeah. UCLA, yeah. yeah. I mean, lost, yeah. Yeah, you guys had probably, you know, national championship aspirations in the first game of the year. You know, we're LSU. We were, okay, maybe a, a New Year's Six Bowl. <laughs> yeah, Something I mean, like that, right? let me put the it like motivation's this. not there is my point. Yeah, I mean, nine wins, ten wins. They expected sure. more of a bounce back. But yeah. Of course, they didn't get that. Mm -hmm. The motivation, the the aspirations there in game one are a lot. Different Let me put it like this: game, so it's apples. We, and we for sure didn't expect LSU to go out and lose to UCLA. I mean, mm -hmm. absolutely, that was a game. I think a lot of fans expected to win by you know seventeen points or so. I mean, because mm -hmm. Chip Kelly's been struggling out there. Uh, I, I personally think it was a bit of a hit job, Chip, to get his brother the job at LSU. <laughs> so, uh, oh guys, hey, if y'all have any questions for Ryan, Ryan's real cool with this because you know he he can go on the flow and take whatever. So if you have any questions for Ryan about Kansas State, hit him up in the chat. I'll put it on the screen and uh, uh, get it rocking and rolling. So talking about those expectations, I wanted to kind of follow through on that. What What is the standard for Kansas State? Because, I mean, for some teams, maybe a 7-5 season is pretty good, but, you know, it sounds like some heads are rolling there in Kansas State after a 7-5 and five season. I mean, it, it's, it's tough for me to understand what the bar is given that the bar has been one thing under Bill Snyder and a completely different other thing, basically for every other coach. So what, what, what do you feel the bar is over there? Most fans overall, generally speaking, would be happy with eight and four seasons consistently. Uh, obviously when you're a team like Kansas state, you're not going to get those highly rated recruits year in and year out. You're going to get some, but you're not going to get them every year. So it, it really is about how you kind of develop these players. And it's interesting to see Chris Kleiman, openly, you know, embracing this new era of college football with the transfer mm -hmm. portal. And, you know, it's not going to be, you know, the typical Bill Snyder, find these diamonds in the rough and, and develop them, you know, maybe call them a quote unquote project, whatever it may be. You know, Chris Kleiman's gone out there and, you know, just last night got a transfer Brandon Jennings from um, Maryland, a, a linebacker who's going to, I would assume, start next season for Kansas State, impact guys that they're bringing in. Um, but, but to answer your question, though, I would say seven or eight wins and, and most fans are happy. Um, and then, you know, you get your one year, your two years where you are good. You've got a chance to win the Big 12. You're going to win 10 mm -hmm. you know, games or so. Those come and go. You know, I, I think it's very comparable with K-State basketball. You know, Bruce Weber's gotten so much heat because his teams can be so good. He's won a couple of Big 12 championships, a trip to the Elite Eight. He's done some great things, but also – has set school records for, you know, least number of wins and losing streaks and all this stuff. His highs are high, his lows are low. And that's kind of how it is when you're Kansas State. Obviously, you don't want those lows to be too low. But I think most fans, if there is a bright future ahead of them, they're okay with, you know, if you're six and six one year, not the end of the world, if you've got a young team. You know what I mean? It's kind of a fine line between, you know, you don't want to be too bad, but also the, the future is what you're holding on to, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what's funny is like you talking about that standard sounds a, very similar to, you know, LSU's basketball team standard, you know, kind of kind of that that make the tournament kind of kind of range, you know, like be, be a good team, you know, um, be a very, very interesting standard for me. Um, so, of course, Colin Klein uh, calling this game. Do you expect the scheme to be dramatically different? Or what, what, what do you feel – is he going to try to make this his own or is he going to try to call playbooks out of the playbook he was handed? Or are you expecting anything too different? This is a good question. And, you know, Colin Klein was a, a tremendous, you know, dual threat quarterback, ran the option a lot. So I'm not saying that he's going to force Skylar Thompson to, you know, be a carbon copy of what he was. But I think we'll see a lot of similarities with, with that. And, you know, Courtney Messingham, like I said, he got fired because of his conservative play calling. Mm -hmm. And Colin, Colin Klein's going to know that. But Kansas State's wide receiver group is probably the weakest, certainly on the offense, but maybe even on the entire team. So it's tough. The options aren't the options. There's not a lot of options with what you can do mm -hmm. outside of Deuce Vaughn. And this was Kansas State's problem last season when the Wildcats lost each of their five remaining games. Skylar Thompson went out for the year. K-State still won two or three games when he was out, and then mm -hmm. the code was cracked that, you know, hey, you stop Deuce Vaughn, you're going to beat K-State. It's pretty simple. Obviously, right. Thompson, you know, with him in there is very helpful, but, you know, you need, you're going to need somebody to step up in this game. I think that 
the tight ends, you know, Daniel Amato Brebe only had 10 catches on the year, but he had over 250 yards through the air. So it was like 26, 27 yards a catch, which was insane. Yeah. So he might only get one or two catches, but you know, he might slip through and, and, and make a big impact on some of these plays. So I would expect uh, a relatively similar play calling approach approach with, with Klein. I would say that the, the, what's the word here? He's going to have, um, I would say more faith in his players to make these, these gutsy play calls. You know, we saw mm -hmm. it was a fourth down play against Texas. Deuce Vaughn was in the backfield all alone in the wildcat and went and, and he got stopped turnover on yeah. downs. It was disastrous. And after the game, he was asked, you know, did you have a checkout? You know, could you maybe check into a different play, something like that? And, you know, without saying it, you know, he said, no, I was you know doomed from the beginning. Texas stuffed the box with eight players. So just, you know, some, some smarter play calls. I think he's probably learned from some of those mistakes Courtney Messingham made, but I, I really can't state this enough. This is a, a really important game for Klein. Yeah, uh, and I, I agree. And I, look, I'm rooting for Colin Klein. I always, he was such a fun player to watch, mm -hmm. man. Johnny I mean, Manziel he, was like, stole that item from him. <laughs> don't, don't get me started on that one. Uh, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not getting into that debate, but <laughs> look, he was one of the best players in the country. I mean, he was like Johnny Manziel if Johnny Manziel was 50 pounds heavier. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, it, look, the magician work of Johnny Manziel was hard for voters to mm -hmm. vote against. Uh, hey, look, here's a softball question for you. Uh, have they named the field after Snyder yet? I'll let you take it. So the stadium is Bill Snyder family stadium. It is Wagner field. I believe so. The field, no. The stadium, yes. I don't I mean, know if they'll ever change the field name, but who knows? All right, personal preference. Would you rather have a stadium or a field? That's a really good question. That's I'm a really good question. I'd probably take I'm the taking the stadium. I'm taking the stadium. I'm taking the stadium every time. The stadium holds fifty thousand people. <laughs> I mean, any local park can be called a field. Give me the stadium every time. Um, and look, this is a interesting question. Um. Uh, American Patriot, one of our consistent subscribers on our show every single week, uh, wants to know your thoughts on the transfer portal. I feel I get a lot different answers on this based on the age of who's answering. So I'm mm -hmm. really interested to hear your perspective. Uh, my overall message is the grass isn't always greener. You know, you've got so many opportunities to go play other at other places, but it may not be, you know, where you're at right now, if you want to go transfer, this may be your best shot. This may be your best position. This may be your best opportunity. You name it, right? Obviously, I'm all for um, giving the players. I, I think it's good for the players. They deserve this. Yeah. If they want to leave, they should be able to leave. I should always, always have, you know, that's how it always should have been. I'm, I have no problem with that. I just, you know, it, it's getting out of control and there's really no stopping it. Like, <laughs> there's nothing yeah. you can do at this point, right? Yeah, uh, I I'm OK with the portal, but I, I just, you know, with a lot of these players that leave, you know, it's are you sure you want to do this? Like, right. you're not, like I said, the grass isn't always greener. That's that's my right. overall statement. Well, I mean, and, and my thing, and this is a good question for Blaine Smith here as a follow up. I thought you think maybe they need to be some sort of regulation with the NIL stuff and, you know, timeline for the portal. I, I, I think in general, we're going to see a bunch of changes between early signing period and NIL and transfer portal. These are all a bunch of new things that have radically changed the sport in a pretty quick time. There's got to be something to change with all these things, right? Yeah. I mean, but then if you, if you just put a timeline on it, you know, then you're just playing a waiting game as to when you are mm -hmm. legal quote unquote to enter the portal. I mean, yeah. that's a good point. You know, there are some ways to stop it, but if you have your mindset on leaving, you know, there's no stopping that player. Like it's funny, Bill right. Snyder, Jerron McPherson mentioned this, a K state uh, uh, defensive back mentioned this at media days, like under Bill Snyder, you were not leaving. Like there was no getting out nowadays. You're, you're free to go. But with, mm -hmm. with, with Bill Snyder, there was just, there was nothing you could do. You're going to stay and you're going to buy into K state. You're not getting that signature or whatever was necessary from the coaches. Right. So, you know, there's, there's players that, that want to go and I'm happy. I wish them best of luck, but, you know, I don't know if they're if a timeline is going to really fix that. Yeah, um, Rick Kelly here wants to know uh, what's your thoughts on K State special teams coming into this game. I wish I had the number. It's 115, 120, something like that. Special teams. 
uh, touchdowns since like 2000 or something like that. K-State leads the nation since 2000 or something like that in special teams touchdowns. So it is, and Chris Kleiman has mentioned this a lot this season, that it is something that they practice, they put a lot of emphasis into. And I think two or three games into the season, K-State really hadn't gotten that splash play on special teams. And, and Chris Kleiman mm-hmm. mentioned it. He said, We're, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come. We practice this a lot. We're waiting for it, and this is part of our game. So, you know, you look at uh, Tyler Lockett on the Seahawks, you know, that's it's someone that always comes to mind at K-State. This was a, a, a brilliant return, you know, specialist for Kansas State. So special teams is a strong suit for Kansas State, and it certainly is 100% something that the Wildcats, they uh, they emphasize and they don't overlook it. That is that is for sure. Good question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my last question for you before I'm going to let you go Um uh, is about the traveling. You know, you mentioned that there's a huge fan base in Dallas Fort Worth uh, with Kansas State alumni there. And probably Houston isn't so bad, but it's not bad for LSU alumni either. What, what kind of presence are you expecting from the the Kansas State faithful? So K State played against Stanford to open the season in AT and T Stadium, and there was about I think just under 30k there, and it was like 95 percent purple. So. Maybe 20, 25,000. I wouldn't be shocked. I think K State's going to have a good showing here. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, DFW is probably the largest market for K State fans outside of Kansas City. So I'd anticipate a good crowd. No, I don't think this crowd's going to make like a difference in the game, like the noise, none of that stuff, but there should be a good, a good, a good showing from K State fans in here. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it looks good on TV. A lot of purple will be on TV for sure. <laughs> Well, Ryan, I'm so thankful for you coming on the show. Of course, you've got a very bright young career. Guys, Ryan just graduated from Kansas State uh, this uh, just a couple months ago. So, Ryan, uh, I'm sure you could use all the support you could get. Why don't you tell people where they can keep up with your work, how they can follow you, all that good stuff. So on Twitter, my handle is at GPC Ryan G. Um, Obviously on Go Power Cat, stay up to date with everything, recruiting, Mm -hmm. all the the stuff with K-State. you know, leading up to tomorrow, I think it'd be a lot of fun to get kind of a, a behind enemy lines perspective on, you know, K-State. So on GoPowerCat.com, but on Twitter at GPC Ryan G, the GPC stands for GoPowerCat for those who, you know, that, I've had to explain that a few times, but uh, GPC Ryan G <laughs> on Twitter. And look, look if, if you're dyslexic like me and you're having trouble keeping up with that handle, go to my Twitter. You know, most of y'all follow me on Twitter already, or P guy underscore seven seven. Go there. I have him tagged in the post for this story. So go give him a follow. Appreciate you, Ryan, for coming on, man. Good luck in the Texas Bowl tomorrow night, man. I appreciate you, Preston. Thank you. Thank you. That was Ryan gilbert with gopowercat.com y'all don't go anywhere because i'm very excited we're gonna have brandon Seho. remember he was formerly with wbrz here in baton rouge now with cincinnati we got a twofer to talk to him of course there's that weird baton rouge ohio kind of bromance going on where all the lsu players go to ohio to either cleveland or cincinnati and all the uh, you know, all the Ohio State players go to the Saints and back and forth. And then Joe Burrow comes from Ohio State to the LSU, then back to Cincinnati. So we got all that Joe Burrow stuff to talk about. And I'm going to ask him about Mike Dinbrock. He's, of course, covered Cincinnati Bearcats, Bengals, all that good stuff up there. And one of the better ones at it. Before that, got to pay some bills around this place. I'm going to thank my sponsors. Tremonti's Meat and Seafood. Do not forget to go check them out at the corner of Airline in Old Jefferson, right behind Parkview Baptist. Tremonti's Meat and Seafood. Y'all go check them out. 30 kinds of meat and sausage. They, of course, have the Heaven's Door single barrel cast strength. Whisk and whisk available it is a staff select. They came in there. This is only available at Tremonti Meat and Seafood. So y'all go check it out. It's $59.99 for a bottle. We're going to hear from them real quick. Quick. Tremontes has meat. Tremontes has seafood. Tremontes has much more. Tailgating and home gating platters. Huge wine and liquor selection. Beer and all the spices you need. Chairman Reserve and Wagyu meats. Ribeye rolls, shrimp rolls, kebabs. 20 flavors of sausage for the grill. Daily lunch specials and game processing. On site catering also available. Good meat ain't cheap and cheap meat ain't good. Visit Tremontes.com. Thank you, Tremonti's Meat and Seafood. Today's show is also brought to you by Dead Soxie. 
They, of course, have their purple and gold suite. I've got a little billy goat hanging above me on my left shoulder here. Uh, they have all sorts of incredible high-quality socks here. The Louisiana Fleur de Lis there. These socks are super nice, super soft, super thick. Uh, we do not, one of the good things about tigerbait.com, we're a little selective about our sponsors. We're not going to take a sponsor that we wouldn't endorse and use ourselves. Of course, check out the quality of these socks. They even have the, the embroidery on the inside that you can only see in the inside, little glue. I, I call them glue drops because I don't know what else to call them. Maybe I'll bring them on one day and like have them explain the science. Keeps the sock, does not sag down your leg. Y'all go check them out. Link in the bio to this video, use promo code TIGERBAIT to get 25% off your order. You won't regret it. I've talked to a bunch of subscribers and fans that have gotten their socks already for Christmas, and they don't regret a single bit of it. So deadsoxy.com, link in the bio to this video. Check out their purple and gold suite. All right, so Brandon Seho coming on in just a bit out of Cincinnati, uh, TV reporter up there. He used to be with WBRZ, of course. I saw we had a few LSU questions. I didn't want to, you know, waste time talking about the LSU end of things while I had Ryan in here because Ryan, of course, you know, busy man. Uh, we wanted to use his time valuably to talk about the Kansas State end of things. Gerald Holyfield, what's up, Preston? Gerald, good guy, man. I like Gerald. Gerald's in here every single week um, and uh, appreciate his support. He's also a Facebook admin. Uh, <laughs> Esteban, what's going on? But yeah, uh, Gerald's a Facebook admin, one of the cooler groups out there. Um, uh, real LSU football fans. I enjoy them. They support our work quite a bit. But Esteban, fan from day one of these LSU shows before we called it the LSU football fix. Let's see here. Sage can play running back. That's from Blaine Smith. That's Sage Ryan, which of course he can. He's an absolute freak athlete and he does, he does have a good body. I didn't actually get to see him play any running back or offense in high school. Um, here's to hoping he doesn't need to, although with all the opt-outs, you might need every body you can get. John Emery Jr. is out. Ty Davis Price has opted out for the ball game. Man, it's, <laughs> who knows, man, but you are going to have, uh, a, a decent stable of running backs. Um, uh, you know, nor notably Corey Kiner leading the way that's who you should expect to be the leading carrier in this game but you're going to have a handful of other guys available for this game um scholarship players so running backs probably not your worst position um and quite frankly as much of an injury concern as say Ryan has been i'd rather him just play his position um let's see all right great question who's taking the snaps kirkland nuss well we don't know exactly the depth chart came out with Garrett Nesmeyer or Tavion Falk listed. Um, that being said, I'd be surprised not to, to see if um, John Trey Kirkland doesn't take some snaps. I'd be a little surprised. Um, so, and I don't expect Nesmeyer to play the ball game at all. I, I expect him. Uh, the they did get a ruling from the NCAA. They said they aren't going to reveal the ruling. The, okay, read the writing on the wall. That means is is it was denied. Okay, because if it was accepted, they'd have him out there. Uh, they'd say, "Yeah, he got approved. He's our starting quarterback." Woohoo! But it probably didn't. So, uh, so between Tavion Falk, which I was a little surprised not to see Matt O'Dowd listed as the starter, but Tavion Falk is more athletic. Um, from the Lafayette area, hometown kid. Um. Maybe maybe they feel that the athleticism will serve him better. Um, and, of course, John Trey Kirkin would bring a lot of that athleticism to the table. So it's, it's going to be a wild bowl game to watch either way. Um, but, no, I do not expect that. Uh, someone else asked, let's see, let's see, let's see. And of course, here's Carter Cooter, who will be quarterback for LSU. Of course, there's your answer. Oh, I see Brandon Seho in the back room. Uh, I don't see his camera on. If he doesn't turn his camera on in just a couple seconds, I'm going to pull him in here. Um, he must he must not have a uh, camera access, which is fine. We'll just hear him in just a bit. But I'm going to give him about uh, 60 seconds, and then uh, we'll uh, we'll just bring him in uh, with or without camera. Let's see here. Um, 
Blaine Smith, good guess. Someone asked about Miles Brennan. Here we go. Don Anderson, Miles Brennan playing. Uh, I see Brandon Seho's getting his camera set up. So I'm going to give him just a couple more minutes. Uh, no, Miles Brennan, I'm not sure has been cleared medically to play and he hasn't practiced at all. And you don't really want to force him into that situation. He, he's not really in football shape or all that good stuff. So you don't really want Miles Brennan. So save him for next year because that's where you need him. In the perfect situation with this current QB depth chart, he's ready to play for the fall, takes your first snap, and you're good to go. All right, without for well i'm a, he looks like he's still adjusted his camera backstage i don't want to rush him oh he says he's good all right without further ado the man who gets called up it seems like every time there's a major ohio louisiana connection brandon seho is in the middle of it every single time of course he was formerly a reporter with wbrz he is now up in cincinnati how's it going brandon Good, man. It's been a uh, wild 72 hours for me between Cincinnati, uh, the Bearcats, and the Bengals here. Oh, I believe it, man. I mean, we're right there watching next to you. Does does it ever kind of come off as a little weird to you how often the Ohio-Louisiana thing crosses paths? Like, it, it's, it's, it seems like a statistical anomaly, right? It's wild. It happens every, like, two or three months. There's some connection, whether it be Burrow, uh, Freeman, Chase. You know, uh, Brian Kelly, I mean, there is connections, it seems like, every two, three, four months. It's it's wild. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember talking to you a year ago, and we were all thinking Marcus Freeman was going to be the guy to, that Ogeron brought in for LSU. Mm -hmm. Of course, spurned LSU and went on to Notre Dame. Uh, and it worked out pretty well for him, I'd say. He's now their head football coach um, this year. LSU did get their guy out of Cincinnati, Mike Denbrock. Brandon, what what kind of offense should LSU fans expect to see from Denbrock? Uh, you should expect to see, you know, a spread up tempo offense that that likes to take shots, likes to move the ball, and they can put up some big numbers. I mean, when he came in here with with Coach Fickle, uh, it was after the Tubbs regime, and you know, Tuberville kind of left Cincinnati bone dry when it came to offense defense i mean there was no recruits it was a bad spot so it mm -hmm. took him a little while to get going but he took what was you know one of the worst teams in the country to a top 10 offense this year putting up you know almost 40 points a game and you know they went to notre dame and and you know really put it up on marcus mm -hmm. free uh defense. yeah it was 17 nothing at halftime they ended up winning 24 to 13 but they controlled the line of scrimmage controlled that game and, uh, you know, it helps when you have a senior quarterback who's got a lot of experience. They had a really good running back in Jerome Ford and uh, tons, tons of weapons. But as much as I know, you know, Cincinnati's got a lot of great talent now. I mean, they've taken that program. Coach Fickle has and made it, you know, a college football playoff contender now this year. But the mm -hmm. talent in Baton Rouge is, is a step above that. So it'll be it'll be cool to see what his offense looks like with that type of talent. I, I agree. It'll be fun. And I, I think a lot of people have kind of poked fun at both Kelly and Denbrock for, you know, having a bit of that more ground and pound, use the tight end type offenses we've seen. But I, I think a good coach adapts to the talent available and it's just a different, it's a different breed of player you're going to get in, in, you know, Midwest versus down here in the SEC. Um, uh, so what, what's been the fan reaction from Cincinnati fans? I've seen, I've seen people say good riddance. I've seen people say, oh, this hurts. I mean, what, what's been the consensus about Denbrock leaving? I think it's kind of been a, a mixed bag. And, you know, I've, I've known coach Denbrock for a few years now working here and covering the Bearcats. And, you know, he's a really good guy, really good developer of talent, good recruiter. And, you know, he did turn this offense around. And, and I think, you know, once they got their guys in, he did make a lot of things better. Now fans, you know, point to certain games and certain drives and maybe some of the flack that that he's got is what you talked about with more of the, you know, ground and pound game, maybe sticking to the run too much on, you know, maybe just out of halftime. There's, you know, the Houston game, I think it was, uh, or in the, in the in the conference title game, it was like three straight runs right out of the gate and, and that drive stalled. And it was just, um, you know, there's just been so it's just been a mixed bag. And I think, I, I think he's done a good job here. And I think fans, 
you know, appreciate what he'd done, but for some reason they were kind of ready for something else. And it's yeah. maybe who, who they knew was waiting in the wing. And that's Gina Gadouli, who's the Cincinnati quarterbacks coach. And he was, you know, one of the best quarterbacks to ever play here at Cincinnati and, you know, was Desmond Ritter's quarterback coach. So I, I think he's a no doubter for who's going to take over at Cincinnati or at least one of the top candidates. So I think that's why fans maybe were excited because, I don't know if excited is the right word, but mm -hmm. looking forward to maybe there being an opening because they know there's a homegrown guy that can step in right away and make a difference. I mean, he's been helping Denbrock for the last few years, but yeah, you know, Denbrock did a lot, did a lot of good here. He he got them, he got them rocking and rolling, and they they have Ritter, they had Ford, like you said, the tight end usage. I mean, he's also the tight ends coach, and they've got he's got one tight end right now, Josiah Agora, who's playing for the Packers. And then uh, Josh Wiley is going to be a guy who will get drafted this year, hopefully in the, you know, third, fourth round. So he can, there's <laughs> definitely, there's definitely, you know, NFL talent that he's developed here in Cincinnati. And uh, I think that's something that obviously is going to come in much bigger numbers at LSU. Oh yeah. Um, so in terms of the success at Cincinnati, you were talking about that homegrown coaching talent. I mean, talk about, I mean, how lucky can a program get a guy like Fickle sticking around as long as he has and, and as much talent. We got Blaine Smith here asking what job is he waiting for at this point? Uh, how much of Cincinnati's just meteoric rise has been attributed to Denbrock versus the Freemans versus the Fickles? Like, like are people just thinking it's all Fickle and – where's most of the credit going to on all this? Or is it Desmond Ritter? Uh, I think it, it mostly is Coach Fickle. I mean, he came in and took a program that was kind of left for dead. I mean, they had their they had their rise originally. It started with Rick Minner in the early 2000s, switched to Mark D'Antonio, then Brian Kelly, Butch Jones. And then when Tuberville got here, uh, it was yeah. just a job so he could you know, have some income and, and then go golfing on his off days. It wasn't really yeah. – wasn't really a, a spot where he wanted to build a program. And so, you know, Coach Fickle is an Ohio guy, obviously playing at Ohio State. He's been in Ohio his whole career. And he just had a vision, and he sold kids on a, on what he calls blind faith, and it worked. I mean, their first year they went 4-8, and eight, and now they just played in the college football playoff. It's, it's wild to see the ride that he's brought them on. The job that he's waiting for, there's one. There's only it, one, right? It, it's Ohio State, I think, is, is the only one. So mm -hmm. as long as Ryan Day's at Ohio State, I think Cincinnati probably not going to be open for a while. Yeah, right. We'll have Luke Fickle now. You know the other jobs that were open or that I thought there was three jobs that I always thought he would leave Cincinnati for, or consider leaving Cincinnati for, and that would be Ohio State number one, Michigan State number or sorry Notre Dame number two, and Michigan State number three. Well, he's already told Michigan State no. Notre Dame didn't wait to interview him because they wanted yeah. someone quicker, and they had Freeman there, and he was the player's favorite. So I think it's really just Ohio State, but you know, credit goes to mostly to Coach Fick, but his his assistants have been loyal. I mean, you had Denbrock here for five and uh, Freeman here for four. So I mean, right? The, the guys were really loyal, and I I don't I don't see uh, Cincinnati taking a step back or Fickle leaving anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, and what? How great is that for the Cincinnati program? I mean, and not to mention, I mean, on 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 its way to being a Power Five program, it, it's moving conferences. So, uh, you know, it, some some exciting times in in Cincinnati for sure. Um, so you weren't on the beat, I'm pretty sure. Uh, just just you know, kind of stalking your profile when Brian Kelly was in Cincinnati, right? But you you grew up a Cincinnati kid, right? Like, were were you watching the team when he was there at all? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I was watching and he, uh, he definitely took a team that didn't have, you know, the type of talent that Cincinnati has now and was able to get them to, to play up. And I mean, they went 2008, went to the orange bowl and then 2009 were about two seconds away or one second away from playing for a national championship. It's pretty crazy. The short story on it was they beat Pittsburgh and were number three when it was all said and done, but they're number five that day and uh, they dumped TCU and then Florida had lost to Alabama, in the SEC championship game. So Texas needed to lose and Cincinnati would have played Alabama, but mm -hmm. Colt McCoy runs out of bounds, throws it out of bounds and uh, they, the clock hit zero and everyone thought, you know, Brian Kelly was taking Cincinnati to the championship. They put one second on their kicker makes a 50 something 
yard field goal and that's the rest is history. But yeah, no, he was, you know, he's, he set the standard of what, what winning was at Cincinnati and coach Fickle right. acknowledged the, after the game at Notre Dame when they beat Brian Kelly. So it's, it's like, like we talked about with my world's colliding, it's just crazy that uh, Brian Kelly's in Yeah. <laughs> Now, and I remember the game at I shot the game for WBRZ at uh, at the Citrus Bowl where Notre Dame, you know, won on that on that long touchdown. What was that? Twenty sixteen, maybe twenty seventeen. Um, won on that long touchdown uh, in the Citrus Bowl to beat LSU. So it's crazy that he's the LSU head coach now. Hey, it's it's absolutely wild, and uh, you know, it, 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 it's exciting for LSU fans just, just to continually have this back and forth, uh, Ohio, uh, LSU thing, because, uh, you know, sometimes Ohio giveth and taketh, uh, Burrow comes from Ohio, then goes back to Ohio and they just had, I mean, that has to be the biggest win in recent history for Bengals. Right. I mean, I, I can't remember anything bigger than that for, for this Bengals franchise. No doubt, it's the biggest win since 2015 when they, uh, you know, clinched clinched the division. Then and went to the playoffs. They hadn't been in the playoffs since then, and that yeah. was that was the Jeremy Hill fumble when they had the lead on the Steelers. Ooh. The uh, one of the most epic collapses in, in Cincinnati sports history. But uh, we won't go there just yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Back to the playoffs, and hopefully it's a different ending this time around. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was it's a big win, and it's monumental because. Cincinnati hasn't had a playoff win, the Reds or Bengals since 1990, like when the Reds won the World Series. So right. that is the that is the type of that's wild. I don't know if he knows if Joe Joe knows it or not, but that's the type of pressure that's on his back. Is that you know there's I, kids there's generations that have never seen a, a, a Bengals Reds playoff win. I mean, I mean, I wasn't born. Yeah, <laughs> with the, they got their last playoff win. That's why I didn't know that. Yep, oh, yep. man. The crazy stat. And so, you know, people are going nuts here. Yesterday's environment in the jungle was – it was crazy. And what, what Burrow has done the last two games, almost 1,000 yards with eight touchdowns, no interceptions. Oh, yeah. Jamar Chase is breaking every Bengals and NFL rookie record. It is wild to watch. Does, does it kind of feel like you just get to cover, you know, 2019 LSU just every single year you know, for the rest yeah. of your career now? It's kind of nice for me because I ended up – uh Cause I left, I left Baton Rouge in 2018. So I was in mm-hmm. those first two years and still, you know, had a lot of good times and good memories down there. And obviously worked with your, you know, covered guys like Leonard Fournette and DJ shark and, you know, those teams and worked with coach O, but I missed the national championship year. So it was kind of crazy. I was talking with, uh, I think it was Michael Cobble, uh, you know, my old sports director at uh, WBRZ. And I was like, I was at the playoff. He just told me to enjoy it on Friday. And I'm like, I just never would have thought, you know, when I got into this business that if I was going to be at a national championship semifinal, be with Cincinnati over, you know, LSU, the two places I work. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of, kind of crazy how that all works. Now I remember when you were in Baton Rouge, you, you participated in a few dance offs. If I remember correctly, yeah. and you have, you have a background as a ballroom dancer, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. <laughs> I did the um, what was it? The dancing for Big Buddy at at the PMAC. That's what it was. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, so did you get to show off at all while they were getting the gat in the locker room? This I did not. I, I did imagine not. you have some moves you can bring to the table. Can't go in the locker room. COVID protocols right now. Um, mm. I can't get the gat. I don't think I have not <laughs> ready ever, but. I will figure that out at some point. I think, I think I, I'm obligated to be in Cincinnati and LSU ties. Yeah, <laughs> probably so, man. I mean, it'd, it'd be a good career. It'd like, like add it to your resume. You yeah. Know? <laughs> got successfully got the gat in multiple markets, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so look, I really appreciate you popping on Brandon. Uh, I'm sure Ohio and Louisiana will have some strange angle mail once again. And all the Baton Rouge media will be calling you once again, because you're caught up in the middle of it. Appreciate you. Can you tell people where they can keep up with your work, where they can follow you, social media, all that good stuff? Yeah, just at Brandon Seho on Twitter is mainly where I do a lot of my stuff. I don't really get on Facebook too much, but there is where I post a lot of Joe Burrow and and Jamar Chase stuff, which I know y'all will be interested in and um, try to keep up as much with college football and LSU too. It's fun. And maybe we'll see uh, 
maybe we'll see a Brian Kelly Cincinnati rematch in a uh, in a game in a bowl game or a CFP at some point down the road. Yeah, I'd love to see Brian Kelly in Cincinnati's bowl game this year. That'd be a lot of fun, personally. Yep. <laughs> well, this has been Brandon Seho. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Appreciate it, Preston. Thanks, man. Have a good one. You too, Brandon. Brandon Seho of WLWT in Cincinnati, uh, one of the one of the the better reporters up there. Does a very good job. Um, he's of course also tagged in the post I made about this on Twitter. So go give him a follow. He posts a lot of good original content. Uh, if y'all saw me watching on my watch the whole time, he was a good enough sport. So he's going live on TV at ten o'clock. Uh, which is, of course, in 10 minutes for them. So I had to get him out of here <laughs> in the nick of time to do his show. So I'm very appreciative of him for being uh, good enough. Um, he mentioned um, someone who's going to have a uh, as a future guest on this show, uh, Jeremy Hill, someone I'm looking forward to bringing on this show very soon. Um, I saw y'all had a bunch of comments, and I'm going to try to get to them uh, before we roll out of here. Um, as many as I can. So, um, uh, y'all, y'all get them out there and I'm going to try my best next five minutes. I'm going to try to get to every comment I can in the next five minutes. But before I do that, I do want to thank my sponsor Tremonti's meat and seafood. Of course I have amazing comments here. Dane Bergeron, who's uh, one of our tiger bait subscribers. Y'all go check out tigerbait.com. One dollar subscribe, premium subscribers, one hundred dollars for the year. You get all sorts of excellent recruiting content. We have awesome video on Michaela Williams right now available. The number one recruit in the country for women's basketball. Uh, plenty of recruiting updates. We do the premium message board. Y'all go check it out. Like Dane Bergeron has done, because uh, what he got from me. Let's see. Is this the comment? Wait, 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 wait. Uh, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. <laughs> he got the recipe to cook these ribeye rolls. Um, guys, I'm not kidding when I say these ribeye rolls from Tremonti's are the best food I've ever eaten. It is incredibly high quality meat, uh, little slabs of ribeyes wrapped in cream cheese, jalapenos, bacon, really good stuff. And I told him, I, he asked me how I cook them, and this could go a number of ways. Um, but I chose, I always do. So I do a charcoal grill. I don't do propane. I love charcoal grills. Uh, and I always look, I think if it's a good quality meat, you just need some Tony's. I, I don't, I don't mess with all this marinade, barbecue sauce, all that. Cr I, I do just Tony's sprinkle the Tony's on, throw it on the grill, let it cook around it. And it came out great. So he, he did, as I said, so, so Dane, tell me, it, it, was it, was, did my, did the ribeye rolls meet the hype that I provided to it? Because I'm pretty confident they do. Um, but before I hear back from him, uh, hear a quick word from them. So y'all make sure to pop into Tremonti's tomorrow to get your bowl game food and you won't regret it. Just like Dane does not regret his ribeye rolls. Tremonti's has meat. Tremonti's has seafood. Tremonti's has much more. Tailgating and home gating platters. Huge wine and liquor selection. Beer and all the spices you need. Chairman Reserve and Wagyu meats. Ribeye rolls, shrimp rolls, kebabs. 20 flavors of sausage for the grill. Daily lunch specials and game processing. On-site catering also available. Good meat ain't cheap and cheap meat ain't good. Visit Tremonti's.com. Thank you, Tremontes, for making our show possible. Your LSU football fix every week. <laughs> Kenny Hooday. I'm going to try to get your comments here. Um, let's see here. <laughs> Short draw, Whitetail. Do you have the recipe? Hey, Whitetail, I think you said you mentioned you know me. Tell me your first name in the comments. Uh, you mentioned something about my time at CLA. Um, <laughs> let's go, Brandon. Hooday. I'm going to assume you meet. There is no other implications to that message other than let's go Brandon say ho and you love you some bingles there's no absolute messages mixed in there whatsoever um let's see here uh wkrp and cincy is good too uh, i assume that's another tv station i'm not too familiar it's a gym you're so knowledgeable on this show man i mean you're constantly dropping knowledge are you are you, are you telling me you also know cincinnati tv stations man that that's wild that's wild uh, let's see here. Give me a DB ball game 
uh, rundown for the bowl game. Okay, all right, give me one second here because I'm, I'm, I'm going to pull this up here to make sure I don't make a mistake here. Uh, let's see here. Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. Um, I just really I, – I, I think Dwight McLaughlin should play. Um, let me see here. I'm I'm just I'm just pulling this up here, guys. I mean, it's an off the cups question. I really don't want to make sure I'm messing anything up here. <sighs> okay. So at corner, we're looking at Darren Evans, and I mean, they don't even have Dwight McLaughlin listed on that. Um, so the, I remember I remember something about that. I'm I'm not sure if he's hurt or whatever. Um, so you've got you're looking at Darren Evans, the transfer from Nickel State, Lloyd Cole, and Demarius McGee are your three listed corners. I'm not sure how genuine this depth chart is, but those are two walk-ons behind Darren Evans. Um, of course, you've got um, Sage Ryan listed as your nickelback right now, um, which I'm, I'm sure he would slide in and be your starting cornerback over the walk-ons. So you might be looking at Sage Ryan, Darren Evans. Uh, of course, at uh, safety, you've got much more depth going on. I mean, you've got Jay Ward, who's healthy, Chad Harris out there, Jordan Tolls, and even Matthew Langwa, uh, who's a, a pretty good player, scholarship player. Um, I look. I'm not exactly sure what they, they've played this really tight to the sleeve. I mean, very tight to the sleeve. Um, I would expect, I mean, you're looking at those safeties and you're looking at those corners and you're looking at that nickelback and you're like, there's a big difference at who they've got listed right now. I would expect that somehow, some way they're going to slide one of these safeties into corner if need be, rather than turning to walk-ons. I'm not, and look, I have no, I'm not exactly sure what this true status of Dwight McLaughlin is either. Um, forgive me if I'm making a mistake and something's out there about him, but I, uh, we will see. <laughs> the ribeye rolls met the hype. You are, <laughs> I'm gaining in stature since Gilbo. Yeah, I appreciate you. Oh, Lil McGee. <laughs> What's up, Charles? I appreciate you, man. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, Kenny Futch confirms it. He's referring to Brandon Seho and nobody else when he says that. Appreciate you. Um, what's my prediction for the SEC West next year? Man, what a... Whew. I'll take a shot at it. Who cares? Um, Ole Miss is going to lose Matt Kerr. Matt Corral. See, I'm working on it, guys. There's just certain names. We've talked about this a few times during my show. I can't say certain names right. Matt Corral being one of them. I have to slow down and say it's Matt Corral. I don't know why. Don't ask me why. Dyslexia wins. Um, so, I mean, you're probably going to have to roll. I mean, Bryce, Bryce Young should be back for Alabama. So we're probably looking at Bama number one. Uh, when it, I think the Jefferson kid's gone in Arkansas. Um, I, I would want to look at how many starters come and return. I mean, these are always off the cusp questions. <laughs> uh, but Ole Miss still has Lane Kiffin, so you figure that offense. And I, I liked some of the things I saw out of Luke Altmeyer for Ole Miss, but with this transfer portal, who who freaking knows, man? Uh, I mean, look, what if Caleb Williams transfers to Ole Miss? Someone asked about Caleb Williams. I don't know if he comes to LSU. I do know that LSU was the runner up for his services, but LSU went all in on Nussmeyer. I can tell you if Caleb Williams comes to LSU, they should. I mean, they should bring in Caleb Williams uh, if he's willing to come because, I mean, quite frankly, he'll be one of the best quarterbacks in the country, but we will see. Um, let's see here. I think LSU is looking like a crash course for seven and five ish or so. I mean, it's not fair to really expect more. Um, of course there's got a, there's a lot of dust that's going to have to settle for LSU. I mean, if you're going off of the roster right now, what you're looking at with LSU, I mean, you're looking at, I mean, last in the SEC West next year. Uh, who am I forgetting? Mississippi state. Um, they're losing. What's his name? That quarterback. Um, uh, Will Rogers is that his name? Anyways, I, I'm terrible with names, y'all. I know the players. I promise you. Um, 
uh, Mississippi State. I don't know. To me, every single quarterback that's ever played for Mike Leach is just a clone. <laughs> it's like I'm not necessarily certain it's going to matter in that offense. Uh, da, 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 da. So look, man, with absolutely no thorough research knowledge, I'm going to go Bama on top. Dude, it is really a crapshoot after Alabama. Um, I mean, I mean, truly, I'm going to stick with Ole Miss because I like Luke Altmaier and I like what I'm seeing out of that Ole Miss team. Um, I'm going to go – who am I forgetting here? Oh, oh, no, 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 Texas A&M. Texas A&M will be number two. So so, so we're talking Alabama, Texas A&M. Uh, we'll go Ole Miss – Auburn, because well, Auburn's going to have to bring in a quarterback, but I, I hear you know they 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 might hit the transfer portal. Um, but uh, that roster outside of that is in much better position than LSU. So I'll go Auburn, LSU, Mississippi State, some some to that effect. All right, I tried my best. Uh, it's way too early for that, but who who cares? Screw it. Um, let's see. Dwight was not listed. Nor- yeah. And flot was the other one. This, this is why off the cusp questions. It's just, yeah, I try. Sometimes a, a guy will slip my mind. Let's see here. John Trey and Matt O'Dowd. Do not forget Tavion Falk turd Ferguson. Let's see here. Does Jay Ward play? Oh, I mean, almost certainly he, it, it, if what you're seeing on that depth chart is truly, who's going to play. Almost certainly. I mean, I would take Matthew Langwa at safety and feel much better with Jay Ward down at corner. I mean, I really would. Um, let's see here. <laughs> what is Austin Thomas's role in this roster management disaster? Uh, look, man, I mean, I blame it. I mean, it, it all starts with the head ball coach. I mean, it, it, there's really one person you can put this roster situation on, and it, it's really not good. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of my old teammates in, in high school. Everyone should know Preston was given the knowledge of every position and even the stat statistic. Glad to see you in your element. Yeah, I, I've always been an LSU nerd, y'all. Um, let's see here. Oh, man, this is one that we Saika Aika. Now, don't you know what I love about players like that? Nobody expects me to say their name right. Matt Corral, they get really upset when I goof it up. But but see, Kaika, I can mess that up all day long, and nobody's gonna say anything. Yeah, he was a beast, and I believe he was Big Twelve newcomer of the year. Um, and that's one of the sacrifices. That look, want to know why LSU defensively is in the roster position it's in? Because Ogeron decided to pull out the rug from the three four and switch to a four three without knowing if. He can truly do it because he wanted to. And there's just, for seven players, their position drastically changes when you switch from a 3-4 to a 4-3. Some of them can fit. Some of them can't. Saika had no spot. Same thing with Tyler Shelvin. No spot. Both of those players were built to play nose tackle in Dave Aranda's system. And both of them lost their home. So <clears throat> players like that, I mean, dude, that's, who whose decision is it to switch defensive schemes? There's only one person making that decision. It's Ed Ogeron, y'all. I mean, I mean, so so that's a major factor for uh, the roster issues, and of course, it's just been a crazy plethora of other issues. Congrats to Aranda on another great season. Yeah, man. Um, I don't know. I don't know how long Brian Kelly's stint at LSU will last, but man. I think I think Dave Aranda's cooking something special in Baylor. I hope he answers LSU's call whenever Brian Kelly does decide to retire. Um, because I, I don't think Brian Kelly's a guy who will be coaching 15 years from now. So we'll see, man. I think Dave Aranda's awesome. Um <laughs> and appreciate you. Je- Jefferson and Rogers are both back for their team. So Arkansas quarterback Jefferson, KJ Jefferson and Will Rogers will be back for Mississippi state. So the, the, that's why I don't like these little off the cusp questions with that, but uh, you know, I shot with it anyway. Um, let's see here. We would be eight. No going in November, definitely four and to start the season. We should be look, Daniel, I, I get where you're coming from. And Florida state is a manageable team to play in your opener. That being said, putting expectations out like saying this team should be 8-0 when I, I think I saw 46 scholarship players listed for this bowl game as available. Y'all, 
that's half a football team. Um, I mean, if if Brian Kelly's able to turn around that and to turn it into an ain't no team, y'all LSU's gonna kick a lot of ass for a long time if Brian Kelly's able to do that. I, I mean, seriously, it, 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 like like don't even worry about next season because you got a dynasty coming. Uh, I have one last message from Tremonti's Meat and Seafood. Y'all make sure to get over there and check out their single barrel, cast strength, staff select, Heaven's Door straight bourbon whiskey. It is available at Tremonti's only. Very smooth, $59.99 a bottle. They have a cool little display of it. Uh, Y'all go check them out the corner of Airline and Old Jefferson right behind Parkview Baptist. We're going to hear from them, and I'm going to get the last few comments before we... Tremonti's has meat. Tremonti's has seafood. Tremonti's has much more tailgating and home gating platters huge wine and liquor selection beer and all the spices you need chairman reserve and wagyu meats ribeye rolls shrimp rolls kebabs 20 flavors of sausage for the grill daily lunch specials and game processing on-site catering also available good meat ain't cheap and cheap meat ain't good visit tremontes.com Thank you, Tremontes, for making our show possible all season. Great supporter of the show, great supporter of the local community, and great supporter of local meat. So y'all go check them out. I appreciate all the supporters of the show who've helped support our local businesses. Uh, Tangy Turtle, UCLA, LSU, Miami, and Auburn are contenders for Caleb Williams right now. I don't see it, but if he comes to LSU, Miles Brennan gets screwed and thus is gone. Um... Yeah, probably um, one, if not both of those guys would probably be gone. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good assessment. Um, but the, the, the fact of the matter is we're talking about a guy who might possibly be the best quarterback in the country next year. I mean, Bryce Young. Well, no, Bryce Young would be the best quarterback, but I'm not sure Caleb Williams is much worse than Bryce Young. Um, so, yeah, uh, I also would throw Ole Miss in there as a serious contender for him. Um, and OU, don't forget OU. He explicitly put out in his little graphic he put out there that o- Oklahoma is very much still a contender for his services. Uh, and you're also leaving out US- USC. I mean, hello. <laughs> he committed to Oklahoma to play with Lincoln Riley. So um, we- we'll see it. But I mean, I get what you're saying about Nuss and Brennan, and it does suck for those guys. But I'll tell you who it wouldn't run off is um, uh, Walker Howard, who is the player you are most concerned of. Uh, look, if l- let's make no mistake. A locker room that includes Caleb Williams and Walker Howard is better than a locker room that includes Miles Brennan and Garrett Nussmeyer and Walker Howard. It just is. It just is. You're talking about – you know, number one quarterbacks in the country out of high school, separated by two classes. Uh, that's a good situation, man. It's a real good situation. And yeah, I, I, that, that'd be a real good spot to be, although you would have to hit then the next year because you do have to wait a year then uh, to bring in a, a plethora of other talented player so we'll, we'll see i don't think it's very likely i just i just don't see it as very likely i do like caleb williams i covered him as a recruit very bright very nice very respectful kid like him a lot scheme didn't feed him that's talking about saika aka um sayaka aika yeah um uh yeah no absolutely and you know that's part of why you're in this roster Third nightmare that you're in for LSU right now. Aranda is a strategic mastermind. His safeties were very good. That's that's absolutely correct. I, I agree with you on that. And I wanted a guy who knew X's and O's like a Dave Aranda, like a, you know, whatever during this coaching process. You heard me say that, but the LSU definitely got that in Brian Kelly. Brian Kelly knows X's and O's football. Um, but I mean, I think we all should just be very happy sitting there watching Dave Aranda do what he's doing at Baylor. LSU LSU has to stop testing for weed is literally legal in Louisiana now. I'm not sure about the legality part of that. Um, But I tell you, LSU has historically had one of the strictest compliance departments in the country. And I think that um, I'd, I'd like to see LSU just be industry average. I'd like to see LSU's compliance do what the average compliance 
department does in the country. I'll put it like that. That's a pretty safe answer, right? Um, is there any word on Trevante Citizen? Where is he going to sign? There's no word, but LSU is in the thick of it. Uh, LSU wants him. Uh, we shall see. He's he'll he'll sign in February. Um, <laughs> Uh, Tangy Turtle trying to get me. Man, t- the Turtles trying to get me in trouble tonight. Talking all these off the cusp questions. Uh, 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 SEC baseball projections is the LSU football fix, y'all. Oh, look, I'm excited for Jay Johnston. Um, I, I'm I'm really excited for what he's done in recruiting and his you know the players who have decided to stick around. I'm super excited to see baseball this year, and I'm very much so enjoying one of the best basketball seasons for men's and women's that I've ever seen. I mean, I'm trying to think maybe 06 or something. Then the women go to a Final Four and the men something like that. It's that kind of season for LSU and basketball. So as a fan, because remember y'all, I, I'm a sta- I'm the football beat writer for Tiger Bay. I don't I don't cover the basketball teams, but as a fan, very much so enjoying basketball season right now. Appreciate y'all for joining your LSU football fix special Monday night edition. I'll be live tomorrow night with Mike Scarborough from the Tiger Bay Studio following LSU's Texas Bowl. Win? No, no, I'm not predicting a win for LSU. Uh, spoiler alert: I'm predicting LSU does not win the game tomorrow against Texas, uh, against Kansas State. But we'll be talking about it nonetheless with Mike Scarborough in studio. Mike Scarborough will then be live Wednesday night with Buddy Sonji from the Tiger Bait Studio. So if y'all can, please hit that like. Please hit that subscribe button, especially the like buttons on YouTube and all that good stuff. Mike Scarborough always makes fun of me when his videos get more likes. So please hit that like button. Appreciate y'all for watching your LSU football fix. I appreciate y'all for dealing with my ADD while I dealt with off the cuss questions. And I appreciate Brandon Seho for popping in. I appreciate uh, Ryan Gilbert for popping in. Both bright up-and-comers in their respective markers. Y'all have a great night.